The highest price ever achieved for a bottle of whiskey now, compared to the beginning of 2020, I think the value is almost double what it was at the beginning of the year. Diversity, intrigue, scarcity. Deep, deep flavors, a lot of richness, dark color. Legacy and provenance behind each bottle. The intrinsic quality of the product and also the investment grade potential really sets this out to be both drunk and enjoyed but also to be collected. I'm Damien Horner, co-founder of Real Vision. In this three-part series, I'm looking at the world of alternate investments. In part one, I investigated classic cars, art and wine. But it was the extraordinary growth of investment-grade whiskies that caught my eye, specifically because I want to know if the same thing might happen to the rum sector, which is just starting to make its presence felt amongst investors at auction houses. So in this episode, I want to focus on whisky and rum. I'm going to speak to experts from across the world to understand why whisky has been such a good investment and to learn whether rum could follow a similar trajectory. I started by chatting with Ken Greer, who is well known in whisky and dark spirits investor circles. It's interesting to see the shift because of course single malt scotch whisky uh, in days gone by was primarily seen as an ingredient in blended scotch whisky. And it's only really over the last 20 years, principally driven by brands like the Macallan, Beaumore, uh, Balvenie, that the category has really started to grow. The most commercially minded brands really historically have been Macallan, um, who more or less pioneered the vintage statement um, and the collectability of whiskey. Uh, more recently, I think you see Dalmore, Beaumore um, are following suit and they're releasing whiskies that are uh, created in limited numbers. Um, they score very well by critics. The Dalmore Trinitas uh, was one of the rarest releases ever um, from that distillery and the 62 year old currently holds the record for the most valuable whiskey ever sold from the Dalmore. Um, equally, Beaumore released a 1957 54 year old, only 12 bottles. That set the record for the most valuable Beaumore when it sold at Sotheby's for, I think it was £330,000 for one bottle. It seems that there are certain brands that are really driving up the values. And at first glance, they all seem to be Scottish. But whiskey is produced all over the world, from Ireland to the States to Japan and Korea. I wanted to know if other countries are now coming to the fore as they might provide less obvious but more interesting investment opportunities. Scotch whiskey is, I mean, that's ground zero for whiskey collecting. The Scotch whiskey market is massive and it, it, it overshadows all other whiskey markets. Um, but Japanese is doing phenomenally well at the moment. If you track Japan and their whiskey output over about the last 12 years, you'll see an enormous rise in value. Even this year, since the pandemic began, the most valuable bottle of Japanese whiskey has changed twice. So we set the record in March this year for a bottle of Kuruzawa that sold for £336,000. Um, that was for the Kuruzawa in 1960. That has subsequently been broken by the Yamazaki 55-year-old. And the highest price ever achieved for a bottle of whiskey now, compared to the beginning of 2020, I think the value is almost double what it was at the beginning of the year. Well, it does seem that Scotland still reigns supreme when it comes to investment grade whisky, but there are definitely other countries muscling into the space. What about the buyers? Are they changing? The consumer um, is probably a global consumer. Very strong Asian market, strong European market, strong American market, but also other parts of the world where people appreciate fine wines and connoisseurial spirits. These are people who live a lifestyle of discernment. These are people who may have been collecting fine wine, have been recruited into the single malt market and see the diversity, interest, intrigue, scarcity, and also the investment grade potential that has been incumbent in the category. And this started off really with single bottles. It's moved to collections like the Lalixis for the Macallan. It's moved now also into the cask arena where many people are actually purchasing single casks in their entirety. 
recently we're finding a much younger audience are coming to play. So traditionally you would expect a whiskey drinker to be a man with grey hair and a beard and a tweed coat. Um, we find now that the under 40s market is really booming and in our recent sale over 50% of our buyers were under 40. So you can really see a migration to, um, you know, away from this sort of traditional style of Scotch whiskey drinker towards a much more dynamic, youthful um, collector. So, phenomenal growth, geographical expansion and younger audiences. These are all great tailwinds for whiskey investors. Just as importantly, it looks like it's not just scarcity that is driving the market. Brands are also working very hard to deliberately grow the investment potential of their whiskies. Coming up with propositions like the recent Beaumore uh, Aston Martin DB5 bottling, which is a beautifully crafted bottling with superb liquid and an amazing presentation in an old DB5 piston that really sets this out as something very, very short in number, only 25, and of course, at quite a large price premium that will still probably be worth more than many years to come. All right, whiskey obviously seems to be an interesting alternative investment. If I wanted to invest, where on earth would I start? The best place to go is probably directly to a distillery and buy the distillery exclusive. Obviously travel's not that easy at the moment. So your next best bet is really gonna to be to buy at auction. One thing I would recommend when buying at auction is looking for a smaller sale in terms of lot numbers. I mean, you really want to be looking at a carefully curated sale where every bottle in that sale is going to be of value. If you approach a, an online whiskey sale that has 5,000 bottles in it, it's really difficult to know where to start. I have to admit, all the signs are good for investing in whiskey, but I can't help feeling that I'm jumping on a bandwagon. The investor in me wants to be ahead of the crowd instead of following it. So just like my co-founder Raul, I keep coming back to the idea of investing in rum. Basically, could it do a whiskey? in terms of explosive investment growth? Or should I be looking at something completely different like gin or vodka? So one of the things that really matters to spirits collectors and the reason that whiskey's done so well, I think it's the dark versus clear spirit conundrum where uh, with any dark spirit, there's age, you know, there, there's a sort of a process of patience involved with it. With clear spirits, I mean, you do get a premium market, but there's not this um, legacy and provenance behind each bottle or each dram that's that's produced or poured. So people look for something that is, you know, that has a history innate in the product rather than something that's been produced to, you know, just shipped out the door and can be drunk the same day. That settles it. It looks like Dark Spirits is the playground for serious investors in the spirits market. And as I said, I kind of feel like the whiskey train has already left the station. So rum is where I'm going to focus my attention, on the basis that it has all the potential to follow in the footsteps of whiskey as an investment. More and more rum is becoming a really important spirit for collectors. It's got everything that whiskey, you know, that, that good whiskey has. It's got deep, deep flavours, a lot of richness, dark colour. Um, and I think that when you look at the independent bottlers who led the way in whiskey collecting, like Silvano Samaroli, he was also actively bottling um, cognacs and actively bottling a lot of rums. And the Samaroli company still do bottle rums. And I think that the foresight for these whiskey aficionados to endorse and get actively involved in the rum industry has really brought a swathe of collectors in its wake. And these are the guys now who are collecting not just whiskey and not just cognacs, but they're really investing and, and getting involved in the rum industry. There are some very strong parallels with rum where it is now and where single malt was 20 years ago. You're finding brands like Dictador, which are strongly focused on that secondary market, are actually driving that with expressions designed to be both drunk and enjoyed, but also to be collected. This year at Sotheby's, we've sold a Dictador charity lot that achieved about £35,000. It was a barrel of Dictador from 1980. We've also seen Havana Club lots that have achieved nearly double their estimates. The collectors have a, have a thirst for rum at the moment, and it's definitely, it's definitely a category that's on the move. There you have it, rum. 
It feels like I'm being drawn inexorably towards it as an investment opportunity. And it's set up just the way I like it. Relatively unknown and therefore still offering good value, riding on the coattails of an established precedent, which in this case is whiskey, and now starting to show signs that it is ready to hit its stride. In the next episode, I'm going to look more specifically at how to invest in rum and focus on some of the brands that have already been mentioned, such as Dictador. Until then, I'll leave you with the thoughts of Ken Greer. So it's been an incredible ride for investors in single malt Scotch whisky, and I think there's more to go. However, I genuinely believe that the rum category could be the next major investment grade segment in the market. So getting in now on the ground floor of this could prove incredibly lucrative over the next decade.